your notes today. And we're into a, a new a miniature section of the notes. This has just uh, half a dozen items to it, but uh, they're significant. Yeah. And these are the attitudes or attributes that describe his motivational <coughs> traits. I tried to introduce a little bit of it last week, but I didn't get to far, very far. So let's take a look at the screen. These traits are the traits that God shows us or shows conditionally, and therefore they can be expressed as God sees fit. Each attribute has huge effects in those receiving them. The other attributes are expressed because of who God is. These are expressed because of that God can. So in other words, these attributes come into to operation when God's direct, God directs them to do so. All the other things we've been looking at are true of him regardless if he does anything or not. He's always omniscient, always omnipresent. You know, all those are things that are continually true of God. He can't even hold those back. He can't refuse to do them. That's the way he is. That's all he can do. These now are optional. He can express them or not. And so I'm calling them motivational traits. Now, as I mentioned in the notes, I don't think I have found anybody else that uses the same category, but that's all right. Uh, I've, some of the other scholars use categories that I don't like, so it doesn't make any difference. They, that isn't the important part. The traits themselves are what are important, okay? All right, it says, uh, I've not seen any other author use this term, but I think it has validity, as I will explain in the study. What sets these attributes apart from the others is that although they are descriptive of God's attitudes and behaviors toward us, they are optional. They may be enacted or not at his discretion. They are not absolute traits that describe God under any and all circumstances. He may express these attributes when he wants to, or he may withhold them should he want to. It is important to realize that God's use of them is not influenced by whether we need, desire, or deserve them. They are exercised or not entirely at the direct discretion for the accomplishment of his purposes and his will. So the first one we're going to look at is the, the concept of grace. Grace is what motivates God to provide benefits to someone who deserves just the opposite, with no expectation or demand for compensation. In other words, God is giving these, that he's not expecting anything back except your love and your, uh, your glory of him. There's nothing we can do to repay what he's giving us in these particular uh, concepts. Since it can never be deserved, it cannot be earned. And God has no obligation to show it. We can earn some benefits by appropriate behavior. And Paul tells us of a time when Jesus will judge the children and give rewards. It would not surprise me if even these rewards were accentuated by God's grace so that they provide us far above what we have earned. Jesus told us that we could lay up treasures in heaven, which will undoubtedly earn fantastic interest in the interim. God has acted in grace to everyone in the world. God has acted in grace to everyone in the world. We have what theologians call common grace. That's what they're talking about, is the grace that is provided for everybody, every sinner, every person, every individual, regardless of who or what they are. These are the free benefits provided to everyone, such as air to breathe, water to drink, sunshine, gravity, the beauty of nature, health, and a whole bunch of other things. Everybody has access to those things of the grace of God. It's common grace. Uh, it could be done, but it's kind of unusual, for instance, to God send rain on a Christian's farmland and next to him not send rain on an unbeliever's farmland. 
It doesn't do that. If he sends rain, it's on everybody. The unbeliever gets just as much benefit as the believer does because he doesn't usually distinguish that way. Now, let's go on. These are unearned, undeserved, but provided anyway by our gracious God. James tells us that every good and perfect gift is from above. Jesus spoke of his Father's care in giving us gifts. He said, which of you, if his son asks for bread, will he give him a stone? If you then, though you are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father in heaven give good gifts to those who ask him? Now we are interested in special grace, not common, but special grace. This is grace that is reserved for and provided for believers, okay? So that's our primary interest. Now, special grace in this course is for that, it's a term used studying God's gracious actions toward believers. The greatest benefit of grace is the provision of salvation. Notice how Paul describes this in Romans 3. He says, there is no difference, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God and are justified freely by his grace through the redemption that came by Christ Jesus. He contrasts grace and works very strongly in Romans 11, where he says, so too at the present time there is a remnant chosen, uh, uh, chosen by grace, and if by grace, then it is no longer by works. If it were, grace would no longer be grace. So God is setting up a, a standard of, of opposition between his grace and any kind of works. Anything you might come up with to try to earn benefit from God. Anything that you come up with, he considers that a work because it's something you're doing to earn it and you can't earn grace. Grace is a gift. He gives it to whom he wants in whatever capacity he wants. Now, he contrasts grace and works very strongly. Now, the explanation Paul gives to Timothy is equally clear in 2 Timothy 1. But join with me, he said, in suffering for the gospel by the power of God who has saved us and called us to a holy life, not because of anything we have done, but because of his own purpose and grace. This grace was given us in Christ Jesus before the beginning of time, but it has now been revealed through the appearing of our Savior. Christ Jesus, who has destroyed death and has brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. Notice that God's determination for pro providing the gospel was made before the beginning of time. And that it is why it does not take into consideration anything that we may have done. We know the story of Saul, who was a murderer, a persecutor of the believers without mercy. While traveling to Damascus to arrest more Christians, God intervened and made him a new creation. Paul's evaluation of himself before this event, and maybe even after was revealed to Timothy, he said, Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, of whom I am the worst. So Paul recognized something radically had happened to him. Now, grace extends beyond salvation. Paul, writing after being a Christian for years, credited God's grace with what he had become. First Corinthians 15, he says, But by the grace of God, I am what I am. And his grace to me was not without effect. No, I, I worked harder than all of them. Yet not I, but the grace of God that was within me. Paul taught more about grace than anyone in the Bible, probably because he knew more about it than anybody else in the Bible. His desire was that grace might become the supremacy in the believer's life. Notice in Romans 5, he says, The law was added so that the trespass might increase. But where sin increased, grace increased all the more. So that just as sin reigned in death, so also grace might reign through righteousness to bring eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Notice that this verse ties God's exercise of grace with his righteousness. It can never be applied unless it is right. This is how the attribute of sovereignty must be modified by the moral attribute of holy 
and right. All right, let's take a look. Uh, I think I skipped one. Yeah, let's skip this. Grace is called the gift from God, which has appeared to all men. That's why I said this is common grace, okay? That's different than the, se the special grace. Salvation is provided to those who accept it. For it is by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not from yourselves, it is the gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. So even the salvation that is provided for us, by which we qualify for grace, is part of the gift. He has to give us that gift first, so then we qualify for some of the other gifts. Writing to the Lord of the Galatians, for instance, who were trying to gain salvation through fulfilling the law, he said this, you who are trying to be justified by law have been alienated from Christ. You've fallen away from grace. Now these were professing believers in the church at Galatia. This, they were in the church. And Paul was writing to the church at Galatia. He was writing to people who professed to be believers. But what he's warning them is that because they have now begun to accept the concept of having to be circumcised in order to be really a believer and a Christian, they were listening to the Judaizers who were preaching that false doctrine, and they were beginning to accept it. it was, they were being drawn toward that. It made sense to them. And Paul was saying, no, you can't add anything to it. If it's by grace, it's by grace. It can't be by law. It can't be by anything you do in obedience to qualify for it. And because of that, you've fallen away from grace. So grace, you see, has been withheld to these people to whatever extent God wants to in order to remove that grace so that they can't use it falsely or expect to think to have it falsely. Well, let's go on. One of my favorite verses was written by a, the productive pen of Annie Johnson Flint. It had embodied a hymn titled, He Giveth More Grace. It's one of my favorites, I believe. I'm going to just, just quote in the notes the second stanza. When we have exhausted our store of endurance, when our strength has failed ere the day is half done, when we reach the end of our hoarded resources, our Father's full giving is only begun. His love has no limit. His grace has no measure. His power has no boundary known unto men. For out of his infinite riches in Jesus, he giveth and giveth and giveth again. We can certainly identify with the response that Margaret Clarkson expressed in her hymn, Come Thou Fount, which you've sung in some of our Part of it says, O oh, to grace, how great a debtor, daily I'm constrained to be. Let thy goodness like a fetter bind my wandering heart to thee. Now the Bible uses some interesting adjectives describing grace. In Romans 5, he talks about being overflowing. Chapter 5, abundant grace. Ephesians 1, the lavish grace. Ephesians 2, surpassing riches. Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones wrote, the ultimate test of our spirituality is our amazement at the grace of God. Now the scriptures indicate that grace is a gift and the opposite of grace is works. If by grace, then it is no longer by works, Paul says in Romans. If it were, grace would no longer be grace. Grace is the means how we become Christians, live as Christians, and grow as Christians. We mature as we draw more frequently and consistently upon the grace of God. It's an interesting passage in, in uh, Peter where he tells us that we are to grow in grace. Grow in grace and in the knowledge of the Son of God. Grace is something that we can start piling up. We can get more and more and more of it as we use what God provides for us. If he provides in grace and we don't use it or misuse it, don't look for any more grace for a little bit until you get that straightened out. 
You see, it's an optional thing on the part of God. He can give it or not. He can withhold it. Now, does that make any sense to you? Just you understand better what grace is all about. Let me look at a few others here. Peter quoted a passage from the Proverbs when writing to young men. He said, God opposes the proud but gives grace to the humble. Jude warned, he said, they are godless men who change the grace of our God into a license for immorality and deny Jesus Christ. You see, the gift that God gives us can always be misused. When we talk about the grace, we're talking about the generosity of God. I think that'd be another good term, and it might be more... Uh, understandable to us if we think of it as his generosity to us. But one of the things that he does when he gives his grace, he does it with wisdom. So God will never spoil you with his grace. Sometimes we're good to our kids and grandkids to the such an extent that we spoil them. Maybe we give them candy, so every time we come in the house, they come to us and expect candy. And, and you probably give it to them every time, because, you know, it's your kids. <laughs> you're bound to it, you love them, so you do that. But, you see, you're spoiling your kid. You can give them all kinds of stuff, some of which does not help them at all. It's going to hinder their growth as something that's not good. God never works that way. He'll never spoil you with his grace. He'll bring it back, he'll withhold it, if it's going to be misused. So some things to keep in mind. Any questions? Comments? Grace is probably one of the things that is most common to all of us as believers. We talk about it so much and so many messages are preached about it and so on. Um, Paul told the church in Corinth, he said, we urge you not to receive God's grace in vain. Which means that you can. You can receive God's grace in vain. You, you can receive his grace maybe to help with a problem or a situation, and you don't make use of it. You go on your own. You think you've got a better idea, so you do it on your own. And God's grace is given to you in vain, both to you and to him. To the churches in Galatia, he said, I do not set aside the grace of God. For if righteousness could be gained through the law, Christ died for nothing. Wow. That's pretty strong when you start talking about trying to work for your salvation. If that were true, then Christ died for nothing. He could just as well have stayed in heaven. But that's not the case. Yes. Uh, you mean, doesn't grace motivate us to keep his commandments when we know him and the Holy Spirit comes to live within us? Because that should be one of our attributes of loving him because of what he does for us, right? Right. Yeah, grace, grace is the means of our living. It's not only our salvation, but how we live our life has got to be entirely on grace. You know, even in prayer, I think it was, uh, was it Peter? I can't remember, Peter or John, maybe it was John. Uh, talk about the fact that, that uh, the, 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 the throne of grace is open and available to all of us. And we're invited to come frequently to the throne of grace and find grace to help in time of need. So it's, it's always there. It's part of how we live our life. Our great grace should be so thoroughly part of us that everything we do is a reflection of his grace. And that includes loving other people. That includes loving enemies. Well, let's go on. The author of Hebrews wrote, make every effort, he means that, make every effort to live in peace with all men and to be holy. For without holiness, no one will see the Lord. See to it that no one misses the grace of God and that no bitter root grows up to cause trouble and defile many. The emphasis on grace through the entire New Testament is extraordinarily hard. It is there over and over and over and over and it becomes so common to us, I guess, that we tend to just 
skip it. We don't notice it sometimes. We don't seek it many times. That's to our loss. And that's not going to be very good. Glorious grace is given in Christ, in whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins, in accordance with the riches of God's grace that he lavished on us with all wisdom and understanding. I like that phrase. When I first ran across that in the book of Ephesians, I thought, boy, that's great. He lavished his grace on us, but he won't spoil you. <laughs> okay? The giver never fails but we may misuse it. Well, let's move on then to mercy. The undeserved decision, this is the definition of it, an undeserved decision not to punish sin. God's mercy is possible because his justice of sin has been satisfied. You rarely, if ever, hear of a judge giving mercy. Sometimes they'll reduce a sentence from 30 years to 20 years. If you call that mercy, I guess 10 years is merciful. But you, I don't remember ever hearing a judge who having heard the trial and even heard the, the verdict of the jury, or if he was given the, the decision to make himself, he decided that such a person was innocent or not guilty, and he let the person go. They just haven't heard of it. It may have been done somewhere along the way, but most of us would have thought of that as not mercy, but foolishness. You know, we just don't, we don't let people get away with things. And you don't expect God to let people get away with things. And that's why when he exercises mercy on us and withholds from us the punishment that we're due, it isn't because we're so good. It is because he's so generous. And his mercy will do it. But he can only do that because the, the sin has already been covered by the, the blood of Christ. So you see, we have to be a believer if we're going to get mercy from God. Because only then can he ex exercise mercy on our behalf if he has already paid the penalty and we've accepted that payment. Okay? The Old Testament states the policy of God. He says, I will have mercy on whom I have mercy. I will have compassion on whom I have compassion. That's God speaking. So this idea that I came up with and been teaching about grace and mercy is not something I came up with. It's something that I learned from the scripture. It says it very clearly that he can give it or withhold it completely up to him in his position. God is described as rich in mercy. One of the ways we'd expect mercy is in prayer. Hebrews 4 it says, let us then approach the throne of grace with confidence so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in time of need. So we find mercy with God withholds from us the penalty we're due and instead gives us grace, benefits that we didn't earn and we don't deserve. Both of those function as long as we're involved with him in prayer and, and, and uh, waiting upon him. Mercy, like grace, is a gift which we are to receive. Um, let's go back to the notes. Now, mercy is the complement to grace in that it withholds from us the penalty that is actually deserved for sin. Sometimes it is compassion one gives to those in need. So the work, word that is translated mercy can also be translated compassion but they're two slightly different uh, factors that a person exercises. Compassion is more the, the care, the expression of care, the expression of love that you would give to somebody who is hurting. It really has nothing to do with sinning necessary. Well, let's go on. It is defined well in Lamentations 3, 22 and 23. 
Because of the Lord's great love, and the word in the King James there is mercy, we are not consumed. That's the definition of it. We are not consumed because of his mercy. For his compassions never fail. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness, he said. Grace and mercy are so similar that the Bible sometimes combines them when speaking of God's actions. In uh, the King James and Second Chronicles, he said, The Lord your God is gracious and compassionate or merciful. Again, there's no obligation upon God to exercise mercy upon anyone. When given, it is just an act of his goodness. Paul gives an explanation of God's action toward Israel and specifically Jacob and Esau. Romans 9, he says, not only that, but Rebekah's children had one and the same father, our father Isaac. Yet before the twins were born, or had done anything, good or bad, in order that God's purpose in election might stand, not by works, but by him who calls, she was told, the older will serve the younger. Just as it is written, Jacob I have loved, but Esau I hated. Now this may go against the, the concept of fairness, but we remember that God is not obliged to meet our standard of justice. His will is the measure of justice. Immediately following the above quotation is this principle which, upon which the choice was made. He said, I will have mercy on whom I have mercy, I will have compassion on whom I have compassion. It's an interesting passage in 1 Peter. Let me just read this verse to you. Peter writing to the, the believers, he said, Once you were not a people, but now you are the people of God. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. You see, our salvation is what qualifies us for the mercy and grace of God. And without those, well, God still gives generously, and he may give gifts to other people, whether it be mercy or grace, even if they're not believers, because his gener generosity is so lavish that he sometimes just provides it. But it's up to him to make that kind of a decision. As a sinner, there are only two responses I can give or receive from God, justice or mercy. I can never receive injustice from him. God cannot even exercise mercy upon us unless his justice has been satisfied. Otherwise, it would violate that justice. The amazing explanatory prediction of the suffering of God, or of Christ, given in Isaiah 53, shows us how God's justice has been satisfied, freeing him to exercise mercy at his discretion. And I'm quoting there, verses 4 and 5. Surely he took up our infirmities and carried our sorrows, yet we considered him stricken by God, smitten by him, and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was upon him, and by his wounds we are healed. The result of this punishment is given in verse 11. After the suffering of his soul, he will see the light of life and be satisfied. By his knowledge, my righteous servant will justify many, and he will bear their iniquities. This is that amazing prediction in Isaiah 53 of the coming death of Christ. And he's explaining to him, us how it is related to his mercy and his grace. They're all involved. Notice how Paul explains this in Romans 3. He says, God presented him as a sacrifice of atonement through faith in his blood. He did this to demonstrate his justice because in his forbearance he had left the sins committed beforehand unpunished. He did it to demonstrate his justice at the present time so that he might be just and the one who justifies those who have faith in Jesus. Now what's he getting at here? Well, the people who lived in the Old Testament did not have a gospel. Not as we define it. Paul defined it in 1 Corinthians 15. He said the gospel means that Christ died, he was buried, 
and he rose again. So in the Old Testament, none of that was true. Now in God's eyes, it had already been done. So God could apply that if he wants to, to people in the Old Testament. Because the fact still remains that it's coming. And it's certain. But it wasn't there for the people. And so the people, if they could think about it at all, didn't know anything about grace. Didn't know anything about mercy. Even though God exercised those, those uh, attributes upon them, they did not know what they were because they had not heard of it. And they didn't realize that their sins had been covered. But God, you see, didn't cover their sins until Christ actually died. That's in our thinking. In God's thinking, it was done. But in our thinking, since we see it chronologically, we realize that the death of Christ didn't occur until so hundreds of years later after these people in the Old Testament, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and so on, were believers in God. It happened much, much later. And God didn't hold them uh, against them, their sins. He forgave their sins even though Christ had not yet died. And that's what he's talking about here. He demonstrated his justice at the present time so that to be just, the one who justifies those who have faith. So God exercises justice upon these people and gave them forgiveness of sins even though the Christ hadn't died yet. Well, let's go on. Um, God's mercy does not eliminate the need for justice against sin, but supersedes justice because it has already been satisfied. God can now forgive the wicked, not because they have earned it, but because God in mercy and, and grace attributes his righteousness, attributes his righteousness to them. Now when a man works, his wages are not credited to him as a gift, but as an obligation. You probably, if you work for other people in your lifetime, or still do, and you go and get your check, you probably don't run to the boss and say thank you for the present. It wasn't even a present. You earned it. It was yours. He's just giving it to you out of generosity, maybe, <laughs> maybe not, but it's still something you've earned and he, you get it. You know, he can't withhold it. It's yours. It's been earned. God doesn't work that way. You can't earn anything from God. And so whatever he does to benefit you in your, your life, you better go and thank him for the gift. Let's go on. You see how grace and mercy complement each other? When God determines to exercise them toward a sinner or a saint, it seems that God allowed the disobedience of the fall on purpose. God allowed the disobedience of the fall on purpose. Why? Well, look at this verse. God has bound all men over to disobedience so that he may have mercy on them all. You see, if we hadn't fallen in Adam, we wouldn't have any need for mercy because we would have no sin. And we would never hear of such a thing as the mercy of God. We probably wouldn't have heard of the grace of God because it would have been unnecessary. So God allowed us to fall and our whole human race to be under that fall in order that he might live like he wants to and provide what he wants to. God's lavish grace is matched by the riches of mercy. Because of his great love for us, God, rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ, even when we were dead in transgressions. Spurgeon said, no other attribute could have helped us had mercy refused. The psalmist exclaimed, I will sing of the mercies of the Lord forever. William R. Newell from Moody, in the realm of his hymn, the refrain of his hymn combined these two attributes of God, clearly referring to the cross when he wrote, mercy there was great and grace was free. Oh, there's another one. It's called love. It is the primary motive for God to express his grace and mercy. This is the motive for giving grace and mercy. 
So they're all related, you see. They're all part of the, these great attributes. We read that God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son. Then Jesus added, whosoever does not believe stands condemned already because he has not believed. So God has done everything that's necessary for salvation. But if people won't believe, they lose it. It's no good to them. To them, Christ did die in vain. It didn't provide a thing for them. This verse says that God loved the world, but that does not mean he loves every single person in the world. Now, do you believe that or not? You've probably heard just the opposite. You probably sang the song that Jesus loves the, all the people, all the children of the world. Well, does he? It doesn't say that in John 3.16. Nor does it say it in any other verse having to do with salvation. It's only for those who believe. The Bible sometimes contrasts those who are loved with those who are not. I say, this, this sounds kind of strange. Well, uh, let me have enough time to explain all this so you know, I'm, I'm not leading you astray. But I'm interested in what you have to say. Well, let's go on here. Love is such a common trait in God that it seems unusual that the love of God is not mentioned in Scripture until Exodus 15. Two and a half, or one and a half books before you get into the Scripture before it's ever mentioned that God loves us or loved anybody. When Moses and Miriam described him with their song, in your unfailing love you will lead the people you have redeemed. This was after Israel had been brought out of Egypt. It was not until Exodus 20 that God describes himself showing love to a thousand generations of those who love me. Pink made an interesting observation. There are many today who talk about the love of God who are total strangers to the God of love. Nearly everyone who is biblically literate, illiterate defines God as a God of love. I think you could go to anybody on any street in any place and it would be very, very rare if you asked them if, you, if they thought God was love. It would be very rare for them to say, no, I don't think he was. I hate God. I think he hates me. You'll find a few that are like that. But most, by far, the most people would all say God is a God of love. They're so convinced of that, for instance, that they don't see any need for salvation. If somebody in their family dies, he's gone to heaven. Why? God loves him. He wouldn't send him to hell. That's not biblical. Okay? Let's take a look at some... Uh, Dave. Is that just a pride issue on their part then? Pardon me? Is that just a pride issue on those people's part then that would think that? I, I don't know what the purpose would... Purpose, yeah, I guess it would be his pride or his... Um, he thinks of his intelligence, maybe he's examined things and doesn't think there is a God, or whatever. You know, there might be something like that. Now, let's go on. God chose Israel above all other people because of his love for them in Deuteronomy 7. But notice what God says about the others. Those who hate him, he will repay to their face by destruction. He will not be slow to repay to their face those who hate him. Now, in my thinking, destruction could be considered an act of love. And yet, that's what it says God will do. For those who don't love him, God's hatred, God's wrath will come upon them. We're not to wrath yet. Probably next week. Let's go back here in the notes. Um... Well, let's take one more look at the, the uh, slide. God's love is firm and immutable to those who are his. Romans 8 promises to those to whom he loved that nothing will be able to separate us from the love of God. You see, you've got a radically different attitude on the part of God for those who are his children. And nothing can separate us from the love of God. Nothing. Nothing we can do, nothing Satan can do, nothing anybody can do. They can't separate us from the love of God. 
It is there, it's firm, and it's permanent. We're never in danger of being out of his love. We probably ought to keep in mind that in Hebrews chapter 12, there's a whole chapter practically on the concept of correction, in which it talks about the fact that God will correct those who do wrong. That isn't that because God hates you because you do something wrong. It's because he loves you that he corrects you rather than leaving you in that wrong condition. So even the things that hurt can be a benefit to us because of his love. Love never ceases. Well, let's go on. Uh, most people define it the same way. He will seek the greatest benefit of another. The definition is accurate, and all the th theologians agree, although the wording may vary. And since John told us in 1 John 4, 8, that God is love, most assume that this is the overriding attribute of God. And God could never do anything to violate love, especially condemning anyone to hell. Love is not always an emotion. It is an action of the will which can happen without an emotion. For instance, a bystander may pull a person from his burning car, showing great love, but no emotion toward the person. He may not even know. We are crying to love people we don't even like like our enemies, for instance. It can be done. I remember a few years ago, there was an accident, I think it was in Washington, D.C., and there were people that were thrown into the, the river. And somebody on the, the bank saw this, and he dove into that river and saved one of the persons out of that thing. And everybody raved about his heroism. That's exact. He acted in love. But he didn't know the person. He'd never seen the person before. He didn't. He didn't jump in because he loved the person. He jumped in because he had love in his heart. that he went in and got him and saved him. So love can work, you see, in various ways, without an emotion at all. So don't wait until you're emotionally attracted before you provide somebody with some help. When God's live, given, love is given, it is unchangeable. Uh, let's go back to the notes. Bottom paragraph. The motivation of love sometimes brings pain, for it is not necessarily that which brings pleasure, but benefit. Don't get those two things confused. We always look at good things as beneficial, but there are a lot of things that are good to us that are not necessarily beneficial, or that are beneficial to us that are not necessarily pleasant. God's discipline is motivated by love for his children, but the writer of Hebrews notes how that love is expressed. Now let me read the passage here from Hebrews. Endure hardship. That's how he starts. Endure hardship. You kind of get an idea that this isn't going to sound too good. <laughs> He's not talking about a new pleasure. He says, endure hardship as discipline. God is treating you as sons. For what son is not disciplined by his father? If you're not disciplined, and everyone undergoes discipline, then you are illegitimate children and not true sons. Moreover, we have all had human fathers who disciplined us, and we respected them for it. How much more should we submit to the father of our, our spirits and live? Our fathers disciplined us for a little while as they thought best. But God disciplines us for our good that we may share in his holiness. No discipline seems pleasant at the time but painful. Later on, however, it produces a harvest of righteousness and peace for those who have been trained by it. There are three words in the Greek New Testament that is used for love. The one most frequently used for God's love is the word agape. We're all familiar with that. This love is exercised entirely at the will of the lover, who does not take into consideration whether its object is lovable. We usually love things or people that bring us pleasure or satisfaction. The motivation is provided by the object toward which we exercise it. But if we love only that which gives us pleasure, 
we are subject to unloving actions. When persons are the objects of our likes and wants, then manipulation, exploitation, and abuse are likely to result, alternating with unprincipled indulgence of the other person's whims on the principle, it seems, of doing them everything they ever want, or to others, I'm sorry, I skipped the line, of doing to others as you would like them to do to you. Parents loving their children by giving them everything they ever want is an obvious example. That's what we call our love for people often does them harm. How many times have we read or heard about a boyfriend or a girlfriend who has attacked his or her lover? God's love is self-motivated and therefore can be exercised toward even evil people. God demonstrates his love for us in this. While we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. The means by which God demonstrates his love is explained in 1 John 4. This is love, not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his son in atoning sacrifice for our sins. See, God loving the sinner, an unbeliever, has to love him, not because he's lovable. There's nothing there to be lovable. There's nothing there that appeals to our Father. He opposes them. He's an enemy. But God still loves them. Still loves them. And he loves them so much that he sent Christ to die to their, on their behalf. The scriptures describe God's love with certain distinctions best explained by Schreiner and Ware, and I'm quoting them here. First, God loves all in some ways. Everyone whom he creates, sinners though they are, receive many undeserved good gifts in daily providence. And second, that he loves some in all ways. That is, in addition to the gifts of daily providence, he brings them to faith, to new life, to glory according to his predestinating purpose. An excellent illustration of God's discrimination in his call of Israel described in Deuteronomy. This is the passage in which that call is given to us. Notice what it says, the Lord did not set his affections on you and choose you because you are more numerous than other peoples, for you were the fewest of all people. But it was because the Lord loved you and kept the oath he swore to your forefathers that he brought you out with a mighty hand and redeemed you from the land of slavery, from the power of Pharaoh, king of Egypt. Know therefore that the Lord your God is God he is the faithful God, keeping his covenant of love to a thousand generations of those who love him and keep his commands. Israel was God's chosen people, but not because they were a choice people. God cannot ignore his sovereignty while exercising his other attributes, and therefore he lacks any obligation to anyone other than himself. When God acts in love toward anyone, it is because he sovereignly chooses to do so, not because anyone is so lovable. Notice that this passage indicates that Israel was the recipient of love that was not offered to any other people. God's discrimination is also described in Psalm 147. He has revealed his word to Jacob, his laws and decrees to Israel. He has done this for no other reason they do not know his laws. Nothing in us caused him to love us. Nothing in us or around us can separate us from his love. No, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I'm convinced that either death or life, neither angels nor demons, neither present nor the future nor any powers, neither height nor depth nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. So, if this is true, we might have to be a little careful when we talk to people to try to win them to the Lord. On what basis, if looking at what, how God has functioned, for instance, with his own chosen people, on what basis are you able to tell somebody who is a sinner that God loves you and he's got a wonderful plan for your life? You can't say that without any confidence or with any confidence because you don't know that. In fact, we know just the opposite. God hates those who are sinners. 
he, his love, in a sense, overcomes his hate in certain conditions, and he draws them to himself because he wants them to accomplish his purpose. The salvation benefits us tremendously, but our salvation is not to benefit us. That isn't why God died for us. If you look at Ephesians 1, the whole purpose of what he does in, in, in saving us is for his purpose, his glory. That's the only reason. So when God sees a sinner, he wants to bring glory through that person. He will draw him to himself. He'll love him to the place he becomes a believer. And then he can express his unending love. Well, let me go on. It's a passage in Romans 9 in which we are told that God actually hated someone. This may appear to be a contradiction to God's universal love, but the first kind mentioned above but is actually not because it considers the second kind. There's a great discussion about what hate means here, but whatever it means, it is somehow opposite to love. The passage describes God's action toward the twins of Rebecca and Isaac. Jacob, I love, but Esau, I hated. Those are contrasts, they're strong contrasts. And so our, whatever power you give to love, you have to give the same or similar power to hate because they're opposite. Well, let's go on. These volitional attitudes were determined before they were born so that their lives could not be taken into consideration for the opposing attitudes. But now you say, wait, wait a minute, God knows everything. He knows everything from beginning to end. He knows what these people are going to do, even though they aren't even born yet true. But when God is talking to us and trying to communicate to us, he has to use timing as we consider and understand timing. And so when we look at it, it uh, uh, we, we see it differently. Obviously, God knew what Jacob was going to do. He knew what Esau was going to do. But he's trying to tell us before he, they did it, he still made his decision and the decision wasn't based upon what he knew. Okay? Hate should be defined similarly to love, but it's opposite. It's failure to look out for the benefit of someone. I doubt that Jesus loved the Pharisees and the Sadducees, to whom he referred as whited sepulchers. Rather than giving them benefits, he pronounced woes on them, the whole chapter of Matthew 23. The heretics and apostates of the New Testament fail to benefit from God's love. The nations surrounded Israel, especially those in Canaan, were to be destroyed. Certainly not an act of love. It is in this context that we should interpret John 3.16. For now, God's love will expand beyond the kind friends of Israel so that people in the whole world might benefit from God's love. Not necessarily that every person in the whole world experience God's love. But God has opened his love now to just keeping it from the little... Uh, group of people called the, the uh, Israelites, and he has expanded it. This didn't happen, of course, until we get in the New Testament. The whole Old Testament is geared toward Israel. And God is destroying people from Israel because they were the enemies of his chosen people. You get to the New Testament, and finally you begin to understand that God loves other people. You remember the problem that uh, some of the uh, disciples had? But God said, I want you to present the, the gospel to the Gentiles. Gentiles, oh, they were evil. We were evil as Gentiles. We were just out of it. They wouldn't do it. They wouldn't even come in our house. They may not even walk on the same side of the street because we were evil. We were somehow dirty spiritually and couldn't be part of them. And God had to choose to do that. He had to lay a, lay a sheet down with a bunch of animals in it to Peter three times to finally convince him that he ought to go see this Gentile person. And he went and saw that Gentile person who was a, a, a Roman officer, and he and his whole family accepted the Lord. And they opened, it opened to the Gentiles. And Peter had a hard time learning this. It's even some time later, he was still uh, not very kind to some of the Gentiles in places where he was, like in Antioch. And Paul saw that and said, Peter, you're, you're doing wrong. These are Gentiles, but they're God's people. We treat them differently now. Paul had a little difficulty too, but he had to have a lot of the Israelites just turn him down. 
And finally, he understood what God said when God saved him on the road to Damascus. He said, I'm choosing you to be my servant to the Gentiles. He finally realized that it became God's evangelist to the Gentiles. So we benefit from all of that. Our response to God's love is to reciprocate and to love him back, by which we seek his glory, fame, and benefit. We're also to love others with the same kind of love, love which we initiate and does not depend upon the lovability of the object. Our love for spouse and children should mirror that of God's love for us. We must remember that God's love is transcendent, it's infinite, it's sovereign, it's holy, and it's wise. It cannot function in an unjust manner. There is a sense in which God's love is conditional, but the conditions are his attributes, not our attractiveness. We must be careful to presume upon God when some defective idea that love overrules any of God's other attributes. That is not the case. We do not diminish the love of God by limiting its recipients. Do you get that? We do not diminish the love of God by limiting its recipients. Since God limited the recipients, God wouldn't do anything wrong. So we can't do anything wrong by doing it either. The extent of his love is well stated in the hymn by Frederick Lehman. The love of God, the last verse. Could we with ink the ocean fill? That's a lot of ink. And were the skies of parchment made? The whole skies, paper. Were every stalk on earth a quill? Every blade of grass was a, a, a writing instrument. And every man a scribe by trade. To write the love of God above would drain the ocean dry. Nor could the scroll contain the whole, though stretched from sky to sky. It's a great concept put in that hymn. Those who refuse God's love and the provision for their sins that he gave will also miss God's grace and mercy and will experience God's wrath. Hebrews, Hebrews gives us a solemn warning. Man is destined to die once, and after that to face judgment. And again, it is a dreadful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. Now we'll talk about the wrath of God next week. Questions or comments at this point? Am I stirring you up a little bit? Yes? You know, going back to Jacob and Esau, which is still a little hard to comprehend for me. I mean, in today's world, there are families with, with the Jacob and the Esau, right? There's maybe one that God would love and, God, and, and the other God would hate, but the people around <coughs> them, excuse me, they're expected to love old people, right? I mean, I, I guess that's kind of a confusing thing to me, knowing who God has chosen. Well, we, I guess the, the primary fact that you need to know is that anything and everything God does, he does for his purposes, for his glory, his will, everything. It doesn't have anything to do with us, except we kind of get the overflow of the blessings. But he doesn't do it specifically for our glory and for our benefit. He's going to he's going to overwhelm us with benefits when we get to glory. We're going to understand grace like we've never known it before. So God provides benefits to us, but that's not the five primary purpose. The primary purpose is his glory. So the things that we sometimes don't understand or misunderstand because they seem somehow to be contrary to how we would do it or what we would think contrary to what is fair, we have to keep in mind it's for God's glory. Whatever he's doing, ultimately he's going to get his glory out of that. And um, I've been watching some movies on, on uh, Pure Flex. Have you, ever, have you ever watched those movies? I, I just ran across them about a week ago. I didn't know they were in existence. 
but they are tremendous testimonies to a lot of things. And some of the exercise, the uh, consequences that they've shown on the movies uh, are very, very well done. And it's very, very biblical. You know, they, it's, it's just a, a good series of films. And there's hundreds of them. Take me the rest of my life, I guess. <laughs> but again, so many of these people, a couple or a family, whatever, get into trouble. Something happens. In one case, a son died. And it, it, the sister was just absolutely thrown into a tussie. She just couldn't understand why God would take. And she kind of lost her faith. She just started questioning God, said it couldn't possibly. But as the story went on, it wasn't very long before she began to find out that there was something good and great that she almost missed because she failed to see what God was doing. And she failed to realize that God, in taking her son home, or her, son, her brother home, was not bad. It was good. He was now in a place of glory. And she eventually believed that she was going to be able to join him. Because at the beginning, when she was thinking of his death, she said, I'll never see my brother again. Something hard to live through. But God always does something to bring good out of it, even for us. But the primary thing will be his glory. And if he gets most of the glory, then we can praise him for that and be glad that we didn't get it, because we don't deserve it. Sure. Any other comments? Yes, Pat. I'm always amazed at how much light the Israelites of the Old Testament we tend to be. Because it seems like in the Old Testament they were presumptuous because they were the chosen of God, whether they obeyed God or not, whether they followed the laws. In the mercy, I, I agree that it's more obscure in the Old Testament, but the Psalms are full of mercy. But they tend to ignore that and thought it was somehow an attribute of themselves that God would would choose them. But in the New Testament, we tend to be just as presumptuous with the mercy of God, thinking, well, everybody, you know, I know some Armenian believers who have been taught, everybody goes to heaven. But apparently, they haven't been taught that Armenians also teach that they can lose their salvation. So it just seems like they pick and choose what to believe instead of reading what it really says. Yeah. Well, the, the whole story, the whole Old Testament story of the, of the children of Israel is one screwy type of a story. <laughs> because God is presented, even at the beginning, as a good God and a beneficial God and a God of grace and a God of mercy and all, and you read the whole story for what is it, a couple thousand years, and the story ends at the end of Malachi. It talks about a curse that's going to come upon the people. That's the end of the story. It's going to be a curse. But the thing that amazes me is this man Jeremiah, a prophet who lived in the last years, the last days of the destruction of Jerusalem by Babylonia. He knew it was coming. He tried to tell his people to go there and you'll be safer. They wouldn't do it. He was being persecuted. They threw him in a well. They actually sent him off to Egypt eventually. He's the one that said, God's mercy is new every morning. You see, there, there were so many things that Israel deserved to be punished for that they, sometimes they were punished. A lot of times it doesn't seem that they were. They should, you know, I felt, so, I, why doesn't God do something with these stupid people? Why does he allow these people, why does he allow this guy to be a king? Why doesn't he get him out and let somebody like David be the king? You know, it's just, it doesn't make any sense. But that's the generosity of the mercy of God. And to me, that's become a much better lesson than thinking the Old Testament is screwy. <laughs> you know? So you started to talk about how do you convince someone who is presumptuous about the love of God. How do you talk to someone about that um, to convince them of their 
you, well, you talk, instead of personalizing it and saying you are loved by God, you talk about what the love of God did. The love of God sent Jesus Christ to come and to die on your behalf. He loved you so much that he came to die. So the love is God's love. It's not their love. It's not even their God's love for them. Because it, I don't know that it exists. It may and it may not. If God knows that that person is going to respond positively, then probably the love is there and it will continue through the Spirit of God to motivate him to accept. So the love isn't completely absent. But again, it's God who does the loving. We can't, I, I can't make claims for what God loves if I don't have some security and I don't see that security. But it still says God so loved the world and the death of Christ and the life and death of Christ was satisfactory, sufficient to cover every sin of every person who ever lived in this world. That's what John 3.16 is talking about. His love is so satisfactory that it covers the entire world. But it's only those who believe who benefit from that love. The people who don't respond in faith, they lose it. I don't know if that helps a little bit. You know, if you, if you think it through a little bit, I'm sure you'll come up with a, a good approach that you could use that you could feel is accurate. Okay. You mean is repentance even the gift of God, right? When we're talking about all this stuff? I'm sorry, I missed repentance it. Repentance is even the gift of God, the grace of God. You know, it's like the prodigal son knew he sinned. He went off into a far country. Yeah. His dad loved him uh, like a representative of God, and mm -hmm. he went out and did all these things. But then he said it came to his senses and he went back to his father. Mm -hmm. So he, he repented. Right. So even repentance is a is a gift of God, right? Absolutely. The ability to be able to repent. Absolutely, yeah. Okay. Yeah, that's uh, the positive response that we give to God is God's gift. Okay. And we always have to have him. Well, let's pray. Be his best. Father. What a joy to look at these attributes that you have. Attributes that are so good. Grace and mercy and love. Things that are almost beyond our comprehension. And yet you try over and over and over again, especially in the New Testament, to try to convince us that these things are true. That these attributes are available to use on our behalf and that we are to seek them and ask for them and then depend upon them in our lives. Help us, Father, not to lose what we've learned. If we don't understand all of it, turn us to the scripture and teach us again what it says so that we might ultimately in our lives glorify your great name. In whose name I pray, amen.